So, beast. Um, so, SSL version 3 and TLS 1.0 in CDC mode use this thing called IV chaining. Okay? So, let's uh, skip to the next slide for a moment and look at CDC mode. Hopefully, this is revision. Has anybody not seen CDC mode before? Here. Okay, good. So, it's revision. So, in CDC mode, we are encrypting blocks. Here's the ith block of plain text in our stream of blocks. We encrypt it by taking the previous ciphertext block, XORing it with the, uh, the plain text, and feeding it through the block cipher encryption algorithm with the key K, and that gives us our ith block of ciphertext, right? And to decrypt, you pass the ciphertext block through the decryption algorithm now, so DK instead of EK, and you XOR with the previous ciphertext block, and then you recover the plain text block. And you can see that decryption undoes encryption, which is a good thing. That's what we want. Okay, okay good. So we need initialization vector. So why do we need that? Well, imagine this is P1, the very first plain text block. There is no P0 here, and in particular, there's no C0 to, to chain in here. So what we do is we is we put here a block, and um, that block C0 is called the initialization vector, the IV. And often in applications, you use something called the chain IV which means that the value here, C0, is set to be the last block from the previous ciphertext that you sent on the channel. So you, you hold on to the last block, and now you use it as the IV for the next block. That's OK, right? Because you know, ciphertext blocks are pretty random looking. Right? What could possibly go wrong with, with doing that? Um, notably, both SSL 3.0 and TLS 1.0 use chained initialization vectors. You might ask, where does the ID come from for the very first message that I sent? There is no previous ciphertext to hold onto a block from. Well, that comes from the key block. Remember we said we split the key block up into keys and IVs? So that's where the very, very first one comes from. Okay? So 1.1 and 1.2 uh, require, the, um, require the IVs to actually be random for each message that you send. And that's because of the attack that I'm about to show you. So it was first observed by Phil Rogaway in 1995, so this is nearly 20 years ago, that if you use chain IVs, then there's a distinguishing attack against any, against CDC mode, and in particular against TLS. So we've known since 1995 that chaining IVs is a bad idea. In 2004, Dai and Moller independently pointed out that this distinguishing attack would work for TLS. So they showed that there would be a distinguishing attack against TLS. Do you remember what a distinguishing attack is? The attacker is able to choose two messages. One of them gets encrypted. He sees the ciphertext. And his job is to say which one of the two messages got encrypted. Was it attack at dawn or retreat? OK, that's his job. Okay. Um, Greg Bard, in two papers in 2004-2006, said that, look, this plain text distinguishing attack can actually be turned into a plain text recovery attack. But only theoretically. He didn't actually show how to do it. Okay, he said, you know, this is the kind of things you need to do. And then Duong and Rizzo, in 2011, turned this theoretical idea into a practical plain text recovery attack, which worked in real time. And the really cool thing that they did was that they, built a, they made a video and put it on YouTube of somebody in real time breaking into PayPal and stealing somebody's PayPal cookies, session, HTTP session cookies. Okay? So these cookies are very, HTTP cookies are very widely used on the web to provide kind of a state between clients and servers and to do kind of authentication, basically. And some of these cookies should only, should only be sent over a secure connection because they're sensitive. And they show that you could steal the cookies, you could get hold of the cookie. So um, they called their attack the beast. And this was all about having a cool name for the attack. It wasn't because it stood for anything. It, it, it does stand for Browser Exploit Against SSL TLS. But I think that's more by luck than judgment. And the key point here, well, there are two key points. One is it took 16 years between Rogaway, Phil Rogaway pointing out this was a bad idea, to it being a real attack that would recover plain text. And at that point, when people were shown the PayPal session cookies, suddenly they got it. They understood that this was serious. Okay? And this is a general theme in this area. If you want to convince people that you have an attack, you've got to show them their password or their cookies or something. You've got to shock them into action. Right? Show them their private key. Really break that discrete log problem and give them their key. That's what you've got to do in, in the world of SSL and TLS. 
Not in the world of crypto that, that most of us move in. People are kind of interested in distinguishing attacks and they take them seriously and they say, well, that's a bad property, you can't properly prove security. But practitioners want to see playtext. You've got to give them the playtext. Okay, so that's what Duo Naruto did. So the key point was it took 16 years. The other key point is that Duo Naruto were not cryptographers. They were black hat hackers. And they presented this at, uh, I think, at Black Hat or Equal Party, one of the big uh, kind of hacking conferences. And they just came from outside of our community with a comp completely different set of tools and applied those tools to, to break this protocol, ignoring all of the crypto. They weren't even aware of BARS results or of, or of Roadway's observation. They just knew that, that uh, CVC mode in TLS was using chain initialization vectors. And at the time they did this, in 2011, everybody was using SSLv3 and TLS 1.0. And about half of all the internet traffic was protecting the CDC mode at that point. Okay? So this caused quite a bit of panic, as you can imagine. So let's look and see how it works. How do you get attack chain by these? So let me show you the distinguishing attack first. So the attacker here, we're going to make it really simple. He just wants to distinguish the encryption of two single blocks, P0 or P1. So one of these two blocks, let's say PB, is going to get encrypted to give us a ciphertext block C1. And let's suppose that C0 is used as the initialization vector. So C0 would be the last block of the previous message. Okay? This is just CDC mode encryption. And then what, the attack, what does the attacker want to find out here in the distinguishing attack? Just to check that you all understand what we're trying to do. What's the attacker trying to discover? If B is 0 or 1, right? Whether it was P0 or P1 that got encrypted. Good. Sometimes the questions are really easy and sometimes they're really hard. I should have a flag that says this is a, an easy question or this is a hard question. Okay, that's an easy one. Okay, so what does the attacker do next? Well, he, he knows that this block C1, because we've, we've simplified right down to the single block setting, right? All of our messages fit nicely into one block. In reality, that doesn't happen, but okay? In the simplified example, it does. So he knows that C1 will be the IV for the next encryption, right? Because we're chaining the IVs. So what does he do? He now asks for an encryption of this block, P0, XOR, C0, XOR, C1. This is a magic block that he's cooked up. And let's see here, he makes a left or right query on this block. That means that, actually, that's, that's wrong. He just asks for an encryption of it. So our assumption is that he can get P0 or P1 encrypted, and after that, he can get messages of his choice encrypted. So he has a chosen plain text capability here. It's a chosen plain text attack. Okay? So he gets this block encrypted, and now he's going to get back C2. Here's a picture. So here's C1 being used as the IV to encrypt this. P0, XOR, C0, XOR, C1, giving us C2. Okay, now, let's see what happens. If PB was equal to P0, okay, if this B was equal to 0, then let's look at what's going into the block cipher here. EK here and EK here. In this case, it would be C0, XOR, P0 going in. And in this case, what would it be? Well, it would be C1, XOR, this stuff, which would be P0, XOR, C0. So by choosing this carefully constructed block here, if this message was P0, then going into the block cipher is the same block twice over. Block ciphers are permutations. They're fixed permutations. The key is fixed. So then C1 would equal C2. Okay? So by looking at the ciphertext and saying, does C1 equal C2, you can decide whether uh, PB was equal to P0. And if PB was equal to P1, then actually the inputs here and here will be different. And therefore, because the block cipher is a permutation, the ciphertext will also be different. <coughs> so you have a, a very, you know, a probability one test of whether PB was equal to P0 or P1. And that's it. It's trivial. And this is what Phil Rogway pointed out in 1995. Okay? I'm not saying that Phil is trivial, I'm saying this attack is trivial. <laughs> I feel it's far from true. Okay, so this should make you worry about chaining IVs. But until you show some of the plaintext, maybe they're not going to pay that much attention. So let's see how we can get the plaintext out. Okay, um, the attack extends easily to messages that extend over multiple blocks. Okay, you just target that last block. So what do we want for a practical attack? We want plaintext recovery rather than distinguishing. And we have to find a way of realizing this thing, this chosen plain text requirement. I just assumed that the attacker could get messages of this choice encrypted. 
But how do you do that in practice? How do you make TLS encrypt this funny block here? It's not so easy, right, to get a, chip, a chosen plain text attack. Okay, so let's look now at uh, going for plain text recovery instead of distinguishing, and then we'll look at realizing the chosen plain text requirement. So now let's suppose we're in this situation now where we've got a plain text block that we want to recover. But we've actually recovered most of it already. We know the first 15 bytes. So let's say the block cipher is AES here, okay? So we have 16 byte blocks. And we want to target this last block, that last byte, sorry, P15. I'd like to recover P15. Okay? So we build, uh, what do we do here? We use, we build a block P dash, which is going to equal P0 up to P14 as the first. 15 bytes, sorry, not 14 bytes. So basically this P dash is identical to these bytes here. And what we do is we vary P dash in the last byte position over all 256 possible values. And we get each one encrypted in turn. Okay? And eventually you'll find that P dash 15 is equal to T15 if and only if C1 is equal to C2. So again, if, the, if this P dash value here was equal to this entire block, then C1 will equal C2. And if it's not, then C1 will not equal C2. Okay? So what we've done basically is turn a distinguishing attack into a low entropy plain text recovering attack. So the, the plain text only has eight bits of entropy. We only don't know the last byte here. And what we do is try all 256 possible values for P15 in here until we get C1 equal C2. Okay? So that's a very easy extension of what we did before. Here's part two. Now what we need to do is arrange that the attacker knows the first 15 bytes of P dash. So let's assume that he at least, uh, let's assume the attacker has this control boundary property, which means that he can arrange uh, the position of the unknown bytes in the key chain <coughs> relative to the block boundaries in CBC mode. Okay? So here we have a complete block, P0 up to P15. And the red thing here, which you can't really see, is the first unknown plaintext byte that we want to recover. So we're going to assume that we know all of these plaintext bytes, and we're going to focus on recovering all of these. Okay? And we assume that the attacker can move this around so that there's, he can arrange that he, certain, he knows certain bytes and doesn't know other bytes. So what does he do? Well, we just do the, first, the previous attack, but we slide things around. So now the attacker targets that last byte, in the uh, just using the previous attack, he recovers it, and then he moves everything to the left one position. So T0, he's now recovered, T0 is, was here, target by zero. He now shifts everything to the left one position and targets this byte in the same attack. And each time he's shifting one byte to the left, recovering one more byte of plain text. So if the attacker has this uh, chosen boundary privilege, he can always slide things around so that um, he's only recovering one byte of plain text at a time. Okay? This, though, also requires the property that he can get the same message encrypted over and over again, and he can control somehow where that message is relative to the block boundaries. Okay? So you should think of this as an HTTP message from the application layer, which will contain something like uh, the phrase <coughs> P equals, okay, which is fixed predictable plain text, followed by the cookie value, which is hexadecimally encoded data here, which he doesn't know. Okay? And so by somehow getting the session cookie sent over and over again inside HTTP, he can arrange for all of this to happen. So that's part two. Now for part three, this is the attack setup that we need to do to realize this. So here's Alice. And Alice is uh, interested in, I don't know, um, American baseball. So she goes to some American baseball website, which is actually run by the bad guy, the devil. And the devil is able to somehow inject himself into Alice's browser. What that really means is that the attacker is able to get some JavaScript running in Alice's browser, in, Alice's browser, in, a, in a particular tab. And the way that the web works, this is trivial, right? You can ease, you know, Alice will visit all kinds of websites. Only one of them needs to be a dodgy website for this JavaScript to get installed here and to be running persistently in the background in Alice's web browser. Okay? 
that JavaScript would like to read this cookie here. This is the secret value that's the subject of the attack. But it can't directly access the cookie. There's kind of a wall here in the way that says JavaScript cannot directly read secure cookies. Okay? This cookie is a cookie that will be used every time Alice connects to this website. So every time Alice establishes a TLS tunnel from some other tab in her browser and connects to that website, then the oops, let's go back one, then the cookie will automatically be attached to her HTTP traffic and sent across the TLS tunnel. Okay? So every time Alice on her browser visits that website, the cookie is being sent inside, inside the TLS tunnel. That's what the attacker would like to get. So what the attacker does is now he does the attack where he also, from this JavaScript, connects to this website. Okay? So he's running in the browser, he connects to the website, and now automatically the browser will attach the cookie for him every time he connects to that website. But what the JavaScript does is it pads the HTTP messages to move the cookie around to realize that chosen binary privilege that I talked about before. This, going back to the previous picture here. Okay? So th this property of being able to shift things around is realized by the JavaScript adding extra characters in or taking extra characters away to control the position of the cookie, which is the red bit, relative to the block boundary of CBC mode. It almost sounds like science fiction that you can do all of this, but you can, in fact, and they did it. And you can see why there had to be kind of hackers to do this, right? You have to really understand how JavaScript works in the browser and understand cookies and cross-site scripting or same origin policy, all kinds of other crazy stuff that um, even to this day I don't really understand. So now um, we've got the get requests, the HTTP requests going across, the cookie being attached. This attacker here can control the position. And now we need a man in the middle to, to see the ciphertexts. Okay? Because the JavaScript here can't see the ciphertexts that are being sent over the TLS tunnel. Because they're being generated down here in the browser, below where he's sitting. So you need a man in the middle to also see the ciphertexts. And then they have to communicate with each other. Okay? So that this guy can say, okay, I've got byte 7, now go for byte 8, and so on, to automate the attack. Okay. So you actually end up with uh, a man in the middle of the version communicating with uh, this guy. Now, how does that work? Well, actually, he communicates over here to this guy, and this guy communicates to this guy using the uh, existing connection that exists between Alice and the malicious website. Okay. So you've got these communicating processes sending data back and forwards. Does it make any sense at all? <coughs> I, don't know. I mean, this is like, for me, this is science fiction. You can do this, but you can. And the point is, I guess, that modern web browsers are so complex that they support all of this kind of functionality of running JavaScript and JavaScript connecting to different servers and, and sending messages and all kinds of things. Okay? So this is just a summary of what I said. Uh, it works for you to read later. Um, it, the summary is it's complicated, but you can make it work. In particular, they were able to extract PayPal session cookies. Do you think that the clickable block cycle will work this account? Yes, I think it would because um, you'd effectively, well, it depends how you use it, but you'd effectively have a different block cycle for each block that you were encrypting, maybe, if you were tweaking it fast enough, and then the attack wouldn't work. That's true. So <coughs> it's an attack that's very specific to CDC mode. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay, so that's the beast. So the beast was a major headache for, for people in the TLS world. It was thought to be a realistic attack, despite the complexity of this picture. And the reason it was thought to be um, a realistic attack was because they had a video on YouTube that showed a session that you being recovered. <laughs> Even if maybe there was a little bit of trickery going on to make that look good or to speed up the attack or whatever, it was pretty convincing to me. Okay. So we showed people point that. The solution would be to switch to use TLS 1.1 or 1.2. Uh, the, the, and that's great, because um, it uses random IV, so the attack would be prevented. You need to be able to predict the IV to do the attack. Instead of doing that, instead of switching to 1.1 or 1.2, the TLS community took the path of least resistance again, and put some hacks in place. I won't go through these hacks now, but they're pretty ugly hacks. Okay. One thing you could do is uh, this one here, 
send a zero length dummy record ahead of each new record that you send. <coughs> and that way, you see, the attacker wouldn't know what the IV was for the actual packet that, he's, that you want to attack, because that IV, the chained IV, would have been used up encrypting this dummy record instead. But in fact, the Microsoft implementation couldn't cope with zero length records and broke. Okay? Even though the spec says you should support zero length records, their implementation didn't. So you can't always do the fix that you want to do. And this, in general, is an issue for this very complex TLS ecosystem with lots of different implementations. Any fix that you do has to work for 99.99% of the deployed software, or it, or it will not be acceptable. So you end up doing some pretty convoluted stuff to get a fix that works in many circumstances. Another thing that a lot of commentators said, a lot of experts said, is, well, we should use RC4 instead. Because you know it doesn't have this issue with IVs. It's a pretty good screen sign for having been with it. And so actually, the RC4 usage went up after the beast attack. Okay? Uh, I don't have hard numbers for that, but talking to people and looking at several implementations, a lot of people switched to using RC4 because all those headaches go away. Why not counter mode? Why did these experts say that's a pass for and not AS and counter mode? Because AS and counter mode is not standardized for TLS. There's no RFC for that. Oh. All of the, when we looked at the ME construction earlier, it was only CBC mode or RC4. So the, there was an attempt to standardize counter mode in the mid 2000s, but it didn't succeed. And a lot of practitioners are, to this day, they're very suspicious of counter mode. Because you know, you're calling this block cipher with a fixed key on a sequence of plain text that are incrementing one, two, three, four, five to generate two random blocks. That must be weak. Oh, that's, that's why they prefer Galois and Tomlin. Yeah, they can't understand the incrementation. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. Very, good. Very good. So there's still some suspicion around counter mode to this day. Although GCM effectively uses it on the inside, so maybe they're, maybe they're finally getting used to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what are the lessons from the beast then? Well, key point is that an attack that started off as just a theoretical vulnerability eventually became a real attack. So the message is that attacks really get better, or worse, depending on your perspective, over time. And practitioners should really listen to some theoreticians. Maybe not all theoreticians, but some of them who know what they're talking about. And in fact, in this case, they did, because TLS 1.1 and 1.2 actually used random IVs, so they're invulnerable to the attack. But the point was that nobody was using TLS 1.1 and 1.2 in 2011. Everybody was stuck at TLS 1.0. None of the major implementations at that point supported 1.1 and 1.2. So you couldn't use random IDs. Okay. Then the final point here is that a lot of kudos here should go to Duong and Ritzo because they came from outside of our crypto community and brought new ideas to bear. The idea of using JavaScript in the browser, padding, the chosen boundary idea, all of that stuff to get their attack to work. So that would raise a question in my mind. Could we use those tools in other places too? the idea of JavaScript running in the browser to get a chosen plain text capability to make attacks real. And it turns out it can. Okay? So two more minutes, if I may. We'll talk about the crime attack. This was also due on the Ritzel. This is their comeback in 2012. You know, they got a lot of headlines in 2011. You have to follow up, otherwise people think you're dead. <laughs> this is what they did in 2012. And this was exploiting the compression. And Antoine reinvented this attack earlier today. The idea is that the plain text length leaks through the ciphertext length. If you look at the length of a TLS ciphertext, it tells you something about the length of the underlying plain text. But the, the plain text length leaks the amount of compression that was done, if compression is enabled. And the amount of compression leaks a tiny amount of information about the plain text. In particular, the compression algorithms are stateful. So if you've seen, if you're running the compression algorithm and you've seen a particular sequence of plain text bytes before, in the previous message, say, that will compress more than if you have it <coughs> before. So what you do in the attack is you basically guess a string. Cookie equals A. Okay? Cookie equals will have, seen, will have been seen before. If cookie equals A has seen, been seen before because the first byte of the cookie is indeed A, that will compress more than if cookie equals A has not been seen before, if A is not the first byte of the cookie. So then by, by trying cookie equals A, cookie equals AA, cookie equals AB, and so on, by extending the length one character at a time, and looking at the amount of compression you get each time, if you're very clever and very careful, you can get the whole cookie back. 
And again, they were using um, uh, they were using uh, JavaScript running in the browser to control all of the all of the plain texts and to do to get the chosen plain text capability that we need for the attack. So they were able to again recover session cookies for HTTP. So that's a quite a serious thing. There's a mitigation which is to switch off TLS compression. You shouldn't be doing compression anyway. It's bad for security. But application layer compression happens all the time and would still be problematic here. So even though you can prevent crime, there are variants on crime. There's one called breach and one called time. You've got to have a cool name for your attack, right? Um, which work against HTTP compression and make the attack still work using, using application layer features, which websites want to use. Websites want to compress <coughs> HTTP traffic as much as they can before they send it. So this is still a problem, actually. In the, world, in the world. So the lessons for crime, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the lessons are again, something you thought was theoretical became practical in 2012, now that, that's a typo. So attacks really do get better with time, right? in case you didn't learn the lesson the first time. Uh, the tools that were developed for the beast were reused in committing crime, okay? and maybe they can be used elsewhere as well. In fact, we use them in Lucky 13 um, and, in the, uh, and in the RC4 attacks which I will talk about tomorrow, so let me leave you with what we need whenever I'm speaking again. But let me leave you with an advert for, uh, for real world crypto. Thank you very much.